welcome to Indie Live's Poetry Open Mic Spot. This poem's called The Abundantly Incompetent, written on the 30th of May 2020 by our very own favourite indie poet, Paul Colvin. The great blonde coiffured bimbo looked on it all with puzzled faith, wrestling with the deathly silence in this empty, senseless place. Eyes shifted with a nervous twitch as cluelessly he rose, like an extra cast from Homer's tales whilst cleansed of Shakespeare's prose. He was a child within a grown-up's world and literally shrunk before our eyes, Gone the emboldened bitter rants, and gone the charm that I so despise. Awaiting, goading, Tory chants from colleagues just as vile and as crude. All alone he had the limelight, and like a frightened rabbit stood. Inept, unkempt, and scandalised, fumbling through his puerile thoughts, he searched the sparseness of this chamber for help to join the dots. But here he stood, this spoiled brat, now silenced like a little lamb, a pretender who's failed us miserably, just one who never gave a damn. The silence now enveloped him, and sweat oozed from every pore. Like a scenes from Dickens Oliver, he walked across the floor. Fumbling through his festering mind, he searched for his finest hour, but he found no words of comfort only those abusing power. This whirlwind of ineptitude within a shapeless human frame lives out his perverted fantasies, reminiscing Churchill's games. He was here to show the wild world that Britain was still great, but unlike his great adviser, it is not he who will dictate. Christmas list. Please can I have a man who wears sweaters and lets me borrow them and roll up the sleeves, who knows the words of old musicals, who doesn't care if my friends phone at midnight, who makes meltingly savoury risottos without using every pan and fork in the house, who pads lithely like Robert Redford in Out of Africa and never reminds anyone of Homer Simpson who does the weeding and lets me do the planting and does not butcher flowers as soon as petal fades to a milky coffee curl and shaves the grass until it looks like a bad skinhead who thinks that seed heads are delightful reminders of Japanese paintings not blots on a well-ordered landscape who likes books by the bedside, in the bathroom newspapers in the kitchen and biros in the spoon drawer who won't get rid of mice in the attic with a 2-2 rifle, who will dance like John Travolta's dad, always prefers a Rubens to a Modigliani, and will happily turn off the football and turn on to me if I start nibbling his ear. And if Santa can't package this lovely Christmas cracker, please can I have him in the sack? The shooting of Dan McGrew by Robert Service. Robert Service, January 16th, 1874, to September 11th, 1958, was a British-Canadian poet and writer often called the Bard of the Yukon. The Shooting of Dan McGrew. A bunch of the boys were whooping it up in the Malamute Saloon. The kid that handles the music box was hitting a jack time tune. Back in the bar, in a solo game, sat dangerous Dan McGrew, and watching his luck was his little love, the lady that's known as Lou. When out of the night, which was fifty below, and into the din and the glare, 
There stumbled a miner fresh from the creeks, dog dirty and loaded for bear. He looked like a man with a foot in the grave and scarcely the strength of a louse. Yet he tilted a poke of dust in the bar and he crawled for drinks on the house. There was none that could place the stranger's face, though we searched ourselves for a coup. But we drank his health, and the last to drink was dangerous than the blue. There's men that somehow grip your eyes and hold them hard like a spell. And such was he, and he looked to me like a man who had lived in hell. With a face most air and the dreary stare of a dog whose day is done, as he watered the green stuff in his glass, and the drops fell one by one. Then I got to figuring who he was, and wondering what he'd do, and I turned my head, and there, watching him, was the lady that's known as Lou. His eyes went rubbering round the room, he seemed in a sort of daze, till at last that old piano fell in the way of his wandering gaze. The ragtime kid was having a drink. There was no one else on the stool. So the stranger stumbles across the room and flocks down there like a fool. In a buckskin shirt that was glazed with dirt, he sat and I saw him sway. Then he clutched the keys with his talon hands. My God, but could that man play? Were you ever out in the great alone, when the moon was awful clear, and the icy mountains hemmed you in, with the silence you most could hear, with only the howl of the timber wolf, and you camped there in the cold, a half-dead thing, in a stark dead world, cling mad for that muck called gold, while high overhead, green, yellow and red, the north lights swept in bars, then you've a hunch what the music meant, hunger, and the night and the stars. And the hunger not of the belly type that's banished with bacon and beans, but the gnawing hunger of a lonely man for a home of all that it means, for a fireside far for the cares that are, four walls and a roof above, but oh, so crammed full of cosy joy and crowned with a woman's love. A woman dearer than all the world, as true as heaven is true. God, how ghastly she looks through her rouge, the lady looks on the room. Then all of a sudden the music changed, so soft that you scarce could hear, but you felt that your life had been rooted clean of all that it once held dear. That someone had stolen the woman you loved, the love was the devil's lie. Your guts were gone. The best for you was to crawl away and die. It was the crowning glory of a heart's despair, and it filled you through and through. I guess I'll make it a spread in his ear, said dangerous Dan McGrew. The music almost died away, then it burst up like a pent-up flood, and it seemed to say, repay, repay, and my eyes were blind with blood. The thought came back of an ancient wrong, and it stung like a frozen lash, and the lust awoke to kill, to kill, that music stopped with a crash. And the stranger turned, and his eyes they burned, in a most peculiar way, in a buckskin shirt that was glazed with dirt. He sat, and I saw him sway. Then his lips went in, in a kind of grin, and he spoke, and his voice was calm. And boys say to he, you don't know me, and none of you care a damn. But I want to state, and my words are straight, and I'll bet my poke they're true, that one of you is a hound of hell, and that one is Dan McGrew. Then I ducked my head, and the lights went out. Two guns blazed in the dark, and a woman screamed, and the lights went up and two men lay stiff and stark. Pitched on his head and pumped full of lead was dangerous Dan McGrew, while the man from the creeks lay clutched to the breast of the lady that's known as Lou. 
These are the simple facts of the case, and I guess I ought to know. They say the stranger was crazed with hooch, and I'm not denying it's so. I'm not so wise as the lawyer guys, but strictly between us two, the woman that kissed him and pinched his poke was the lady that's known as Lou.